right, welcome everyone. We are gonna get started here. Um, and if you have anyone, friends or family who are still trying to log in, uh, just have them reach out to me. Um, welcome all and thank you so much for joining the Office of Advancement for our Davenport Dialogue Series. We're excited to be kicking off the series in April. Um, and before we jump into our presentation, I just wanted to take a moment to familiarize everyone with this platform that we're using today, which is Collaborate. In the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a little purple button that's got some arrows on it. If you select that, it'll allow you to use the chat function. And this uh, webinar is going to be an interactive webinar. So feel free to use that chat function as questions pop up throughout the presentation. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Um, but feel free if questions pop up, uh, feel free to use that chat function. The other this interactive series that we're going to be doing is that we'll have a polling option. So we'll have a couple questions that will pop up uh, and just make you aware that question, uh, April will, will address that question. We're just going to take some polling information. It'll pop right up on your screen and you can select what uh, option fits best for you. Now that screen will remain up until you hit the little X button. So feel free to just close that out after you've had the opportunity to review that poll and we have a discussion around it. Um, and then questions or any technical issues, again, feel free to use that chat function or if you're not able to use that chat function, you can email alumni at davenport.edu and we'll help you out with that. So before dive into our content, I wanted to take the opportunity to share with you some exciting updates from the university that you may or may not be familiar with. Every five years, the university develops a vision. We reached our 2020 vision and we're excited to be kicking off our 2025 vision. We ended the last vision excited to celebrate a 77% retention rate. And as we enter our 2020 vision, our focus on mentoring our first generation students and our Latinx initiatives will allow us to increase our retention rate with a goal of 81% by that 2025. Our focus is the knowledge of urban education and building on the need for STEM focused educators. As we continue to support our students through our College of Business, Technology, Urban Education, and Health Professions, we continue to serve the industries and companies of Michigan through a market-driven approach to develop and deliver degree programs. So we're just really excited to start kicking off and celebrating our 2025 vision. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce April Ruiz, who is a Davenport University alumni that graduated in 2008. April is the owner and lead mastermind of Mosaic Masterminds. And we're so excited to have you join our Davenport Dialogue series and present some tips and tricks for virtual learning. So without further ado, April, take it away. So much Whitney and thanks to Eric for your uh, technical support. Uh, good morning, everyone. Glad you could join us today and I appreciate your time. I'm hoping that this presentation will be helpful to you. And I want to start off walking through my journey just to learn a little bit about me. So I was one of those kids who knew exactly what I wanted to do when I graduated from high school until I didn't. I thought I wanted to be an engineer so I started in an engineering program and decided that wasn't really for me so I took uh, I, I transferred to Davenport Panthers to study international business and a minor in Spanish. From there, I knew I was destined to become a healthcare professional. So I moved to Puerto Rico, I worked at a hospital for a while, came back and could not seem to land an interview in any healthcare entity for some reason. So deciding that that may not be for me as well, I began substitute teaching in my local public schools district. And after a while, I got into the city of Grand Rapids working in different governmental departments, including uh, parks and recreation, streets and sanitation, hydraulic engineering, human resources. And while I was working those jobs, I started private tutoring. I learned that there was a growing need from families in my community to have some added support as they supported their students in their learning. So I began that. 
and started to grow that business while I began dance instructing. So I took my love of dance uh, from a child and began teaching classes in local studios and other entities around the city. Eventually, I moved to nonprofit philanthropy and I, while there, uh, got my MBA. So I just want to encourage you, if you have a student who is kind of all over the place, stay focused, uh, stay encouraging of them. Remember, 51% of students who attend college do not have a clue what they would like to major in when they first get there. So they'll eventually figure it out. Just to share a bit about my roles in education, uh, as Whitney said, I am the owner of Mosaic Masterminds, which I began in 2003. And we match certified and experienced teachers with students based on their needs. We serve learners of all ages, starting around preschool age through adults. And some of the subjects we offer help in, just as examples, are the areas of math, science, and languages like Spanish. And we also offer support in standardized test preparation, including the SAT, the GRE. We have been fortunate to work with families at this point in seven states. And we have secured some partnerships with local nonprofits as well as the state of Michigan. I have also been an employee of Grand Rapids Community College since 2015, where I started off as a professional tutor, and I have since begun as an adjunct professor teaching several classes at the community college. So for today's talk, I want to discuss the importance of trying to navigate virtual learning. I know this is a reality for a lot of us at this point, Sometimes have been easier than others, I'm sure. So based on my experiences and the best advice I can offer, I just like to bucket some tips and strategies into three categories, which I have called communication, concentration, and celebration. So for communication, it's important to remember that virtual school, first of all, is it's school. It's not the traditional way that we have come to know school, but nonetheless, uh, the coronavirus has catapulted families into this whole virtual learning space, whereas before it was an option, now it seems to be the go-to for educating our students. So I like to offer some things to look for in an ideal virtual learning situation regarding educators and your students. Educators should be setting clear expectations that are reasonable, and they should show their faces and provide interactive activities during their virtual learning sessions. It is imperative that open communication lines be kept between the teachers and students and you as parents. Students should also make sure they are constantly communicating with their instructors and their parents. And this is for some of those older students, but it applies to younger kids too. They shouldn't disappear. That's not going to help anyone in the process of the education of your student. So if there's anything going on, it's important to keep communicating with your, your teachers, your, your students' teachers, just to let them know what, what may be happening if there's some type of uh, emergent situation. And students should learn how to self-advocate. At, at very young ages, this is important. This can help eventually with uh, just taking esteem in oneself and then also being able to express if there are any challenges a student may be experiencing. And self-advocacy also takes the role of asking questions and being transparent about any special needs students may have. What I ask of you as parents is to keep open lines of communication with your students and their instructors very important as we you know discuss with the educators and students each of us have a role and communication cannot be stressed enough be sure to set clear and reasonable expectations of your students so that they also know that they are accountable to make sure that they deliver on what they say they're going to do and you also advocate also advocate for your students this is their learning which cannot be priced and we want to make sure that you are able to feel comfortable asking instructors any clarifying questions you may have about the curricula, about your students' performance. But this is in good times and in bad, which is why I put an asterisk next to that 
uh, different components in these bullets. This is not just when things go awry or if there is something that needs to be uh, addressed because of a deficit-based need. This is, this is often. So be sure to advocate by communicating with your students and the teachers in good times and in bad. So at this time, I think we have a poll and I would love to hear from you about your experiences with communication. How often do you communicate with your students about their virtual school experiences? All right, results are in. Looks like we have the majority of folks saying once a week. And I personally, I think that's very appropriate. Uh, that is, is what I would do. And it's also possibly uh, something good to consider as making it a routine. So maybe every Monday you have a designated day that you're checking in, every Friday, whatever makes sense for you based on how your student is learning, what your, your students, teachers, are facilitating in terms of schedule, but I think that's that uh, that's great. That's very good. I, I encourage that. Thanks for answering that. Next is concentration, and it is essential that we prepare environments that set the toning for learning. This can help foster concentration for the students, and it can help you as well. So prioritization is number one. Organize your day and protect your time. If you do not protect your time and block time throughout the day, it is very easy to get off track. Rest for success. This includes, but is not limited to, bedtime routines and brain break. Sleep is exceedingly important. It is so underrated. I say it today and uh, I'm always promoting resting for success. If we are fighting sleep deprivation at work, we know that to me that feels like the worst. And it's so different with our students. We want our students to be able to feel rested and prepared for learning. So when they lack sleep, it is harder for them to learn, it's harder for them to focus, and it can lead to challenges with modifying uh, their self-control. It, it may lead to moodiness. So we want to make sure that their brains are rested and having brain breaks can also enhance remembering things as they're learning. So take breaks so you don't break down. Dress the part. No pajamas. Please, no pajamas. I know that I personally feel very relaxed when I'm in my PJs. And it doesn't do much to help me with my focus levels when I'm feeling that relaxed. Same thing with our students. We don't have to promote a culture of professional dress or business, casual even, but what they would wear to school is how they should show up in front of the computer, in front of their device for virtual learning. So we don't wanna have our energy zapped. We don't want our students to feel uh, too relaxed to the point where they, it becomes distracting for them. So I would encourage dressing appropriately for school. And I would say next we have designation of spaces. Do not mix business with pleasure if you can avoid it. When we do that, uh, and I wanna keep in mind, we know that not our spaces, all spaces are equal. But where we can, let's try to designate certain spaces where students would have the potential to focus better as opposed to in other spaces. So if I would encourage segregating the bedroom from a study area. If there is no other option, perhaps a corner in the bedroom as opposed to studying on the bed or even in the bed, which is always fun to see students just kind of roll over on their pillows and log in for session. Uh, so I encourage, you know, good posture, having attentiveness, and just having a space where they can 
focus and not feel so relaxed as if to engage in recreational activities at the same time. Minimize distractions. Again, in a perfect world, we would have no distractions. But background noises can be a challenge. And so we want to be sure to minimize them where we can. It's an effective way to study and prepare for learning if we can designate certain areas that are without as many distractions. And where we can just, you know, it's important, excuse me, to minimize uh, those background noises. Use of headphones may help with that. Also, I would encourage for younger kids to have the gadgets and, and any toys put away that could also create distractions. So lastly, engaging as a team. I think this is something that is underutilized for all of us, for parents, for students, for educators even. No man is an island. Everyone works interdependently. That's how we exist. School is no different. Virtual school is really no different. So parents and students, again, speaking on that communication piece, be sure to engage with one another. Be sure to speak with your children about the essence of partnership. Yes, they are earning the grades, they are attending the classes, but not without your support. Certainly without, not without your support and encouragement. So take this head on with the mindset that you are achieving together. This is a culture of learning in your family. Parents and parents, please reach out to one another. You can benefit from learning about your experiences, what is working well, what is driving you crazy. It's really important to get that support and just to dialogue with one another about how you're handling things with your household for virtual learning. Uh, what things you're interested in. Maybe you can seek new opportunities together, new strategies together. So that's another thing I would say to take advantage of. And students and students, I tell my students all the time, especially my tweens and teens who are married to social media, that is a prime tool to use for communication around educated things. So while they are keeping up with the latest posts and tweets and YouTube videos and TikToks, you know, it's just as simple to say, hey, what'd you get for number six on this biology quiz? What did you do for that essay Mr. Jones wanted us to write? You know, so I think while students manage to stay as engaged as they can during these social distancing times, that's a great opportunity for students to collaborate and also focus on team and their approaches to learning. So of those six strategies we put into practice, how many would you say your student uses regularly? All right, so we have kind of a mixed bag here. We have a few folks who do uh, say one to two times, and then we have some that say three to four, some five to six. So I think it really depends on what what is the comfort level uh, for your student. I would definitely encourage more than one always. There is always more than one way to approach a solution. There are multiple ways to take advantage of the best opti uh, the optimal opportunities for, for learning. So very good. Lastly, celebration. And this may sound a bit cheesy and a bit, you know, like, oh yeah, sure, we're celebrating. What are we celebrating? This is crazy. I'm pulling my hair out. But there's always opportunity to find joy and reflection of celebrating, regardless of what the circumstances are. There are several reasons I encourage you to recognize your efforts. For one, there is no virtual learning rule book. If there were, we would have this all figured out and we wouldn't be wondering how to proceed with this, this time that we're in. So as far as uh, virtual learning and, and hybrid learning and the combinations, you know, since no one has this figured out, just encourage yourself to do the best with what you have. 
don't beat yourself up if you feel like you have erred in some way. And if you feel like you're falling short, again, reach out to your supports and just keep going. There, there is no quote, right way to navigate this. This is a little bit unprecedented. And so we're just moving along and in this together. Another reason to celebrate is you have the right to the gift of life and the right to education. So of course, just being alive is always, to me, good reason to, to find joy. But additionally, it is important to know that according to the Education Commission, we are in a learning crisis globally. We are uh, facing some, some times where students may be getting educated, but not necessarily retaining and grasping the information. I think in the United States, we have a huge advantage with uh, the technologies we've been afforded and the institutions, although they're a little all over the place sometimes. At this point, we were doing fairly decently in terms of having access to education, but globally, there are some young girls who don't have the right and the privilege to even attend school. There are some young boys who live too far from their local school, or maybe tuition is an issue and there's not enough grant funding in place where privatization is at play uh, in access to education. So it's important to know that there is a difference between attending school and learning. So with the virtual setup, whereas in person, it was already a challenge where some of our students have had what I call the Swiss cheese model, where they might not have grasped something at some point, and then it just becomes a cumulative snowball effect, and it's harder and more frustrating for them to pick up concepts that are building on the previously learned items or the expectedly learned items. So we have another layer of challenge ahead of us with the virtual components where we're now removed from the classroom. So it's really important to always just focus on the fact that we are, in, we are able to uh, participate in this type of education, but also remembering that we need to partner the best we can as a community to rally around this educative process for our students. Take pride and comic relief in the fact that you are juggling a new routine component. So you have puns on your plate already. Now you can add the title virtual teacher. I'm sure that wasn't the, the plan for many of us, but it is now uh, another role that you're wearing, another um, the role that you're walking out. You know, so just, just take time to not take things too seriously. I know that a lot of this can be exceedingly stressful if you're trying to work from home, you're trying to keep your home, you're trying to change diapers potentially, or maybe you're trying to help students uh, navigate college prep things. And now there's this virtual school piece every day. Just Take time to smell the roses and acknowledge that you're doing just fine. And always congratulate yourself because every day you've made it through another day. So now I'd like to hear from you about what are some of the ways you celebrate virtual learning? Feel free to take the poll and express. Oh, I'm sorry, this one doesn't have a poll. <laughs> So I'm just curious to hear if anyone would like to put in the chat some ways that they have taken time to, to celebrate virtual learning with their students. And if not, something that may be triggered in your mind now as an idea to begin doing that. And if not now, that's totally fine. We can discuss it openly during the Q&A session as well. And April, while people are typing the chat box, um, we do have a question. We'll, we'll save that for um, the Q&A coming up here. We had Danielle say, as an educator, these are great suggestions. Setting the tone for virtual learning greatly helps students to focus, engage, and take ownership of their learning. As a parent, I thank you for the tips. I will tweak our approach to optimize my son's learning while at home. And thanks for reminding us to celebrate. This is quite an undertaking for your comments and, and stay encouraged that you're doing awesome. 
and it looks like after a week of cooperation and no tears, we celebrate by getting ice cream was a suggestion. Awesome. Another one one that just came in is we go out to eat and celebrate getting through a sometimes rough week of virtual learning as well as a virtual as well as a virtual working for the mom and dad yes do do recognize your own efforts and celebrate them as well very nice and i love to eat i find any reason to eat so i'm all for it <laughs> Okay, well, uh, just to recap on, on uh, what we looked at today on some tips and, and tricks for virtual learning. Communication, again, it is, it's very, very essential for the dynamics in any relationship. And this is one that's exceedingly complex as we've experienced between the educators and the students and, and parents. Communication must happen. And I would say to routinely foster communication across uh, those three stakeholders in this process. Concentration, again, please uh, think about how your, your spaces can be designated, how they can be segregated so that you can do your best work and your students can do their best learning. And celebrate always, you know, take time to focus on the, the efforts and working hard and also doing your due diligence to just just live, take deep breaths, and definitely enjoy your family while you work through this process. Well, thank you very much for your time, and I'd love to take any questions or comments you may have. So April, we did have a question come in during the presentation. They asked, how often should I be communicating with my child's teacher if we are fully remote learning? Right. So I, I would say early on, it's important because we have so many avenues of communication nowadays. It's important to establish what is the teacher's preference for communication and the ease of access to communicating with, with that teacher. Uh, is it an email? Is it a phone call? Is it a text? So uh, as we, as evidenced by several folks in the poll, I promote communicating with a frequency of, of once a week. And I would also like to remind us that teachers, particularly in K-12, are very, I'm sorry, K-12 obviously, but in early elementary are very swamped right now. Um, a lot of what I'd say, several of our parents, when I say my parents, my, my clients, are educators as well with their own families. So they are right there with you with this, this challenge, this new crazy way of living. And there are just so many expectations. There already were in traditional schools, particularly in the public school systems. There are there's so many expectations set for teachers. And just like we don't have a clue what we're doing sometimes, teachers aren't really fully equipped to do everything they need to do to address uh, your students and their learning and support them. Because of responding to this national, I'm sorry, international crisis, some things were just kind of quickly uh, put together and they are trying to navigate the best way they can and then still honor the, the process of teaching your students. So I will say, I've said that to say, that a uh, very frequent communication may not yield a frequent response because they're just very overloaded with a lot of things in addition to curriculum, in addition to reporting to their superiors, and in addition to just trying to foster a, an interactive environment. But once a week is definitely what I would suggest. Wonderful, thank you. We've got a few more questions here. Um, looks like the next one is, how do you suggest that we keep teenagers engaged or motivated for day-to-day -day virtual learning? In my experience, it's easier a little bit to motivate younger students. I just think that they have, um, they, they take joy and excitement in smaller rewards, so to speak. I think for older students, it's important to work together on a plan that will 
include what efforts and outcomes will result in rewards. So I encourage engaging your, your learners in incentive processes, and, and you know your kids best. So whereas one student may respond well to incentives, another student may respond better to de-incentivizing. And it, we don't want to stifle the process, but if there is incentive in losing an incentive, then that may be a route to explore as well. But for tweens and teens, I know um, there are so many distractions, especially since they're already very engaged with technology for being social. It's hard to focus and segregate. So again, it's just kind of setting the bar, designating expectations. And then also I would in include them in the process of what, what would bring them motivation to do something if they're already lacking it. You know, some kids are, actually motivated to stay engaged. And sometimes there's moments where just don't feel like it, but speak with them about what they think would be uh, a fulfilling reward for doing their part in this process. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna combine these two questions here. I think they're kind of asking the same thing. Uh, somebody asked, what would you recommend if you don't feel the students are getting the level of education via virtual learning you're hoping for? And another question was, any suggestions in terms of support supporting apps or systems that you like or prefer if you feel things are a little light in terms of the virtual curriculum? So I think uh, addressing the first part of that, I think it's easy for us to feel stuck in the virtual learning space. As I, I shared earlier, it's a bit, it was a bit more, I think there were more plentiful options to the education facilitation process, whereas now it seems like this is, is, is what it is. Uh, there are options yet for hybrid learning where students can combine uh, in person with the virtual experience. There's also still homeschooling. And, you know, for if you want to take a break, per se, from some of the overuse of screen time or some of the virtual engagements, you know, uh, there are some, I guess I'd say old school, you know, uh, paper products that you could subscribe to in, in a homeschool program. There are also a lot of homeschool communities out there if that's an alternative that you would like and that that's a little different from virtual school, even if you're at home in that space. But also that's another responsibility to take on if, if you would like to be at that level of engagement with your student where you become their teacher pretty much solely and that's something to explore as well. Um, and there can be a combination of that too. There, there are combinations now where you might attend in physical spaces, virtual, oh, I'm sorry, traditional school, and then combine that with a homeschool component. So there's that balance, so to speak, with the traditional interaction and having social opportunities like sports and, and other extracurriculars with the option to homeschool your child in the ways that you see fit. And can you repeat the second part, Whitney, of that question? Yes, absolutely. Any suggestions in terms of supporting apps or systems that you like or prefer if you feel things are a little light in terms of virtual curriculum? Okay, so if I'm understanding that question correctly, being asked for any tips or, or faves that I have that may help to supplement the experience if we're seeming to lack or be displeased with, with the uh, material. Okay, thanks for verifying. Yeah. So uh, there, there, I, there are several things that I use when I'm working with students and some go across you know grade levels, some apply to young students versus older ones, and then some are specific around age. And um, wow, there's just so many out there. First one I always promote, is Khan Academy. I was kind of wondering when Khan Academy first came out if it would have longevity in the educative space. And it is not only here, but they just have countless videos and they, you know, started off kind of like a math support, but they are across humanities and sciences and computer technology and, and all kinds of areas. So I use that for even my college students. 
Uh, there are a lot of supplemental practice components and, and videos uh, which are helpful sometimes. So that, that's one that I often promote. There was a really cool uh, interactive periodic table that I encountered with one of my high schoolers a few weeks ago. And I'm happy to, to have that sent out if that can be um, help, so helpful to someone. But I was blown away at how many things are out there with the uh, opportunity to engage and just have this real time knowledge bearing app or, or software that can help cement properties of elements and the every everything from electromagnetivity to uh, the atomic masses and you know the the flow of electrons throughout different processes. So I I'm struggling to come up with specific tools that I could recommend. I will say that YouTube is a little bit underused in my opinion. I often find YouTube videos on virtually anything. I use it to supplement a lot of my lessons with my younger ones, whether they be in English or Spanish. There are rap videos folks have created if your kids are really into music um, and helping them learn that way that include components about math skills and ways to memorize processes in science and even history facts. So I, I think, yes, Khan Academy and YouTube, yes, I absolutely. I, I think those are two that I strongly use and, and widely use. And as far as very specific things, I think I'd, I'd really have to kind of go through my history saved and bookmarked websites that I could refer out. But those just seemingly have endless bits of material because they're constantly being uploaded and, and shared. There's always, there's always something out there. And I would say too, like I said, this, this isn't traditional. We're in these unprecedented times, so to speak, but nothing is really new under the sun. Someone has created something that can help us address the challenges we're having. I can Google virtually any topic, any question, any subject for any grade level in any capacity, and there's something there. There may be a project that I can do uh, at home. Uh, there may be a, a website that has just different facts around the issue. If they're even in literature, there are tons of excerpts from poems and and different stories you know that you know students may need for ELA or, or English lit so the, the internet is just just an amazing thing that I did not have growing up but I definitely take advantage of now helping to facilitate education for my students thank you April it looks like our final question here is how do you address IEP implementation during virtual learning Thank you for that question. IEP, IEPs, first of all, are very wide ranging. And I think that, I just like to say first, I think that our system, however broadly we define that, can do a slightly better job of managing and working with IEPs and even issuing IEPs. I think that there is such a vast array of different needs that students have, and they get overly bucketed into just IEP. So what I would say, depending on what the need is or where the extra support lies, definitely take advantage of your resources. And this means that there before, with traditional school, there were professionals in place that are, uh, afford opportunities to help our students in their areas of need. And even though we have this new arrangement where we're not necessarily in the physical uh, spaces together, there are still many supports. And I would encourage you to work closely with the school. I know there's a ton going on, but with that advocacy, just don't give up on that. If you need extra help facilitating that, the IEP for your child, definitely utilize your resources, your school, uh, your teacher, if there's social workers or counselors or even the administrators, if if you feel like you need to get some more results. 
but also I would, there are lots of parents with students with IEPs. And like I said, they're very wide ranging, uh, the, the different levels of needs that students have and what they need. So feel free to, to talk with other parents. And sometimes you may not even know if there are other parents who have students who are working with IEPs also. So that's what I would suggest. I'm hoping that was helpful to that question. Thank you. Wonderful. April, we really appreciate having you join us this, this morning. And I know that on the next slide here, you just had some suggestions for some resources. Um, and this, this uh, webinar is recorded, so don't feel like you need to write down all of these hyperlinks. Uh, we'll be sending out the recording here. Um, and as we transition into the next slide, I really just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you, April, um, your insight and, and your guidance to kind of help our future leaders in a very unprecedented time is really appreciated. Um, and again, as I said, this, this webinar is recorded. I know there was someone who had, had asked that question in the chat box. Uh, so what we'll be doing to wrap this up is in the next couple of days, you will receive an email from our team that will have the recording and it will also have a very short survey. And we would really appreciate if you took the time to fill out that survey. Um, I also invite you to follow us on our social media channels, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there. And I invite you to go to our website. We will be posting as we build up our webinar series, posting all of these recordings. But it's also a great resource for you to find um, some of our events, our resources. Um, so please feel free to check out our website. And if you have any questions or want to follow up, please feel free to email us at alumni at davenport.edu. Thank you, everyone.